thank you everyone for being here this morning to um, listen to uh, Amish. Um, it's, uh, it's, it's been really fun um, experience starting on the 4th of January. Um, Amish and I were very good friends. So we never worked together and now we are working together and could have gone you know, either ways, but it's, doing an incredible, it's been an incredible experience of uh, um, exchanging of notes, of uh, pictures, of houses, and yes, and no, it's to pink, it's to red, it's to chintz, it's to stripey, it's to whatever colors uh, we have under our uh, eyes. Um, and today we're going to go through actually a visual journey. Um, I'm sorry about the screen that apparently is not working now anymore, but you know, probably if you want to look at, if con focus on this screen here, visual journey of uh, Hamish um, uh, uh, aesthetics in a way, how he started and how it's Im images and houses that shaped and forged your vision to become what Hamish is now. Um, you know, needless, you know, no introduction as, as uh, David said earlier, um, but you know, the, the, is your last venture is to be the editor-in-chief of the World of Interiors, this iconic magazine that we're very lucky to work. Um, so um, I'd love to start working, I'd like to start showing, sorry, um, if I can make this work, Oops. Um, with the first image of a reddish house, Cecil Beaton reddish house. Um, Amish, of course, chose all this imagery, and I want to know why did you want to start with, uh, uh, like, Cecil Beaton's house, a reddish in, in wheelchair? Well, when I was thinking about this discussion that we were going to have, I thought it would be interesting to consider some of the places that have really had an impact on me and kind of shaped the way uh, I think about my own environments, the sort of things that I'm drawn to, and in fact, how I brought that um, information and inspiration to the pages of the World of Interiors. And um, I was um, obsessed by Cecil Beaton as a little boy. Uh, for those of you who don't know, uh, Beaton was... Um, this extraordinary polymath. He was a, a, a photographer, a stage designer, a wonderful and acerbic diarist, a writer. And um, at the age of about eight or nine, um, at, a, at a jumble sale in England, I found a copy of his book, The Glass of Fashion, which was this um, amazing document of the people of style, designers, but tastemakers who had um, inspired him through the first half of the 20th century. So you were eight or nine already? Yeah, already, yeah, I was eight or nine. It. So the obsession continued. Um, British Vogue used to do a, an annual talent contest. They may still do it. And when I was 14, um, I wrote in for that as a sort of earnest schoolboy. And one of the questions was, which person, living or dead, has most inspired you? And I wrote a, a little essay about Cecil Beaton. Anyway, I ended up being invited to Vogue House. I was given some um, glass of Buck's Fizz, and my, <laughs> my mom said it turned my head and I never looked back, which is very true. And so I was kind of determined to meet Cecil Beaton. This was my sort of thing. And I think I made a New Year's resolution in 1980 that that was going to happen as a 14-year-old boy. And unfortunately, Beaton died several days into January 1980, so I thought, well, that's obviously not going to happen. I think, ultimately, my second strategy was that I'm going to become Cecil Beaton <laughs> um, in a different iteration. But what happened was that um, Sotheby's sold the contents of Reddish House, which was his beloved house in the English countryside, and they did a, um, they did a kind of open house, and it was my first ever solo trip away from home. So I, I that was age... 14. I got a series of coaches and stayed in a sort of bed and breakfast with a Corby trouser press and a cheese <laughs> made and just thought I was so grown up and then got the bus to Reddish, which is this enchanting village in Wiltshire. And it was magical going to the house because his um, gardener had done all the flower arrangements exactly as though Beaton had just stepped out of the room. There were sort of magazines everywhere and books. And I was very, very inspired by it because it was this extraordinary biography of a life, and it really made me think that houses can be so autobiographical. You know, it was pictures from all the artists he'd admired, and his adventures in modernism. You know, in the 60s, he'd been called Rip Van with it because he was this older guy who was very um, obsessed by the Rolling Stones and uh, what was happening in art and music and 
and everything. This is a marvelous picture of him. Yes, in fact, to that the... point with David Hockney in the winter garden that he created in his house, which was like a little, very theatrical set. It was like a little doll's house. It looked like a grand house, but you went in and it was just a cottage with pilasters on the front. What do you think it was the, the room that really caught your eye when you were at Reddish House? Oh, well, there was a drawing room that, again, a room that he'd built on, which was sort of done like a kind of Edwardian turn of the century room. It had, it was not the most appropriate decor for, a, for an English country house, but it had kind of crimson velvet on the walls and then chintz with green undercurtain, a, a chintz with big blousy cabbage roses, um, chintz undercurtains, and I can sort of remember every single object in the room. <laughs> there was an auction and I got my paddle and I was super excited and I had a, <laughs> I had a, a budget of 25 pounds. And, you know, everything just went a little bit higher than I wanted, and most things went, of course, much higher. And then I, finally I managed to get a, a two-handled loving cup um, printed, a Staffordshire loving cup printed with a, a peacock, and I thought that was an appropriate metaphor for Beaton. So yes. I took that home on the, on the bus. Um, so that was, that was really exciting, and it just... I think it was just the experience of a house that can bring so many different moods as you walk from one room to another. And, um, you know, it was really conceived as a theater designer would conceive a house, you know, creating atmosphere and magic. So, so what happened when you left the house? I mean, it was, you know, the, the, the world looked in a different way for you? Well, I, I, yes, I left the house, but the house never left me, as you'll, <laughs> as you'll see with some later slides. Oh, gosh. This is uh, another house, it's uh, um, Barney Roger. Um, talk us. Tell, tell us why Barney Rogers' house was, again, another okay. of your inspiration. So Barney Rogers was this unbelievable British dandy. Um, he was born to a very um, doer, self-made Scottish businessman who had be, been a barefoot child and made a fortune in industry and had three... married a very artistic woman and had three very artistic sons, none of whom ever married. And... Um, <laughs> They pursued their uh, individual artistic interests. Bunny um, became a fashion designer. He dressed people like Princess Marina, who was the great fashion plate of the British royal family, um, and um, actresses like Vivian Lee. And he was a total dandy. In the late 40s, he developed this kind of Edwardian dandy look. He had this bowler hat, a high kind of... Um, Karl Lagerfeld starched collar and suits, and everything was all in a tone. And you would see him walking down the street, and everything would be chocolate brown from head to toe, or it would be fawn or lilac. And I was obsessed with him, and occasionally I would sort of see him around town. He was a very um, dramatic figure. And did you, ever, did you ever stop him in the street and say hi? I never stopped him, but I was a student at St. Martin's Art School, and I was doing a journalism course, and my I found out that one of my tutors knew him, and I said I would love to interview him. And um, so that was my first ever interview subject. And I turned up, I will never forget it, he had a beautiful stucco house on, on Addison Road in Holland Park. And he opened the door, he had a scarlet cashmere turtleneck and very narrow stovepipe pants in um, trousers in a black and white check. And, he was very, very spelt. He was very proud because he, he had the same waist measurement as uh, Lady Diana Spencer. <laughs> and he, he was a rather startling vision. He had kind of silvery hair in a Marcel wave. And he was very, very, very smooth skinned. And he, he, the first thing he said to me on the doorstep was, don't be alarmed, young man. I've had so many liftings. I'm the only man in London who has to shave behind his ears. <laughs> <laughs> he was so fantastic, and I think he sort of found a kindred spirit in me. So he was incredibly forthright um, in this interview and was told me all about his kind of queer life in 1920s and 30s London and Oxford and traveling on the Riviera and everything, and he took me all around the house. It was so glamorous. It was the first house I ever went to that had scented candles in each room, which was a great <laughs> novelty then. You'd be surprised to hear. No one had a scented candle. Um, We're talking about London in the 80s, London right? London in the early 80s, and he had, there was a different scented candle in each room, so each room smelled different, and it, so there was this olfactory experience as well as this wonderful visual experience. Um, when uh, he, he gave these legendary balls every year 
um, and he gave one called um, The Ball of Fire, and he, he, he made an appearance in a bugle-beaded, sort of ombre-shaded cat suit that went from all the colours of flame, <laughs> <laughs> stepping, stepping through a flaming ring of fire. That was his entrance into the party. Um, and that, that was a very unforgettable thing. And he took me all through his house, um, ending up in his closets, which were so wonderful. He had all these collections of etchings by um, a turn of the century artist called Paul Heller. Um, and there was one on each of these panels, and then the panels opened, and there were these incredible clothes. You can see some of them there. Did you manage to pull any of the, you know, the, the, the fancy clothes out of the cupboard? Or he brought everything. I mean, he was very, he, he was absolutely amazing. I think he was quite surprised when he read my interview, which I, was not for publication, but I did send him um, about how quite how frank he'd been in our conversation. But it was it was a good essay. It was a very good study in how to get intimate stories out of people. Um, very good training for my future life. Um, and then the, the, subsequently, there was a there was a, a, another Sotheby's sale, and I um, and I ended up acquiring quite a lot of things from that sale, including some of those suits. I think that lilac jacket on the far left. Talking about lilac, we all know, you know, you actually remember the very first Instagram page was Hamish in lilac. Yeah. So we all know that lilac is your favorite color. Did, did it ever come from that, from that house? Just you know, I've never, people always ask me, and I, now I do think that it probably did come from Bunny Roger, yeah. There was a lot of like, mauve in his house. A mauve, exactly. Yes. Sorry, not lilac, mauve. That's the one for Hamish exactly. Scott, favorite colors. Now, exactly. from Bunny Roger, we go through um, uh, the lovely uh, Stephen, Stephen Tennant. Tennant and Wilsford Manor. Yes, yeah, so this was, uh, Stephen Tennant had been Cecil Beaton's great friend. And, um, and Cecil really, really admired him and envied him. Cecil Beaton was, a, was a, essentially a middle-class boy, borderline upper middle class, who was completely self-invented, wanted to live in this world, and, you know, had this dream of a life he wanted, <laughs> went for it and ended up with it through incredibly hard work and industry. And Stephen Tennant was this very great beauty who was an aristocrat and didn't have to work, and um, had his great flowering moment in the 20s. Didn't he spend his last 10 years in bed? He basically spent his last 10 years. Stella Tennant was his niece, um, great niece, and she, she remembers going to see him, and she walked into the room and he said, the nose, the nose. She was a teenage girl, and she was a bit self-conscious. Stella Tennant, as you might know, had a legendarily beautiful nose, but she felt very embarrassed by it, and he said, <laughs> she thought, she assumed it was a compliment, and he said, um, the nose, the nose. I've always had the most beautiful nose in Britain. <laughs> oh, poor anyway, Stella. <laughs> he was in his own little world. But um, I, uh, again, there was a sale of his house that the world of interiors documented. And this was one of those issues of world of interiors that I absolutely poured over. And you'll see that, that this has a kind of Miss Havisham quality to it because it was decorated by, with the help of Siri Morn in the 1930s. It was a very modish decorator, wonderfully done. And then accumulation and accumulation. And I kind of look at this from time to time as a kind of warning to me <laughs> to, to know when to stop. Um, <laughs> so you can see in the, you know, these curtains that Siri Morm had, had, had um, introduced in sort of sorbet colors in the 1930s, they were hanging in tatters. I mean, the whole thing was full of amazing stuff, but, you know, a little bit, a little bit um, elegiac. But, you know, again, high, high, high impact. What do you think of the different colored um, candles? Um, that was a, a, an easily copyable detail that I easily and immediately copied. <laughs> <laughs> it was a great effect. I mean, all, there were lots of little theatrical details, lots of shells and Baroque and... Um, it, so, it but was, how did you get in, you know, nowadays it's very easy, you know, to, to get to know people who, from the past, but, you know, through social media, through online, but when you were, growing up in London and you're being still a student or at the beginning of your career, to get to know all these characters, where did you find them? Uh, I spent a lot of time in the public libraries. Um, yeah, of course, in those pre-swipe internet days, if you wanted to find out about someone, you had to go and see if there was a biography out there or a thing, and I, um, you know, I couldn't afford a huge library of books. Um, and so, yeah, I spent a lot of time in, in libraries. The St. Martin's Library was wonderful. It was Usually, it was just John Galliano and I in there, and he, he developed this technique of stacking up all these bound copies of Vogue and Harper's Bazaar, 
and doing all his sketches behind it, like a little barricade. <laughs> so no nobody could see, see that. <laughs> no one could see the amazing, as it turns out, work that he was producing. So, you, you, because you studied fashion at St. Martin's. I did. I went to St. Martin's to study fashion with every intention of being a designer. I had been sketching, um, well, how old was I? I was, I was uh, 19. I'd been um, sketching since I was about four or five, hundreds of fashion sketches every day and costume designs. Um, and I went and I was kind of honestly a bit intimidated by the very great talent of John Galliano. Um, and I was also missing writing and the idea of this fashion journalism course that you could take there seemed to me to combine a lot of things that I was interested in. So, And then talking about... Um Yes, you see more of the it. The 80s. We're talking about the, the um, Ryan and Lander mansion of Ralph Ronan in New York. Yes. Um, that was when you moved to New York, right? No, in... no, no. It was before. This was oh. um, as, a, as a student. So what had happened was, um, as, a as a 19 year old foundation course student, I, um, um, uh, I, I'd entered uh, a magazine called Harper's and Queen, Harper's Bazaar did a teenage talent competition, and I ended up doing the fashion pages for that. And they liked what I did and invited me back. So suddenly I was, you know, getting proper invitations to fashion shows, even if it was at the last rows. Or I, I always wondered what 5T meant, but of course it was standing. Um, <laughs> <laughs> so I remember with, arriving at the Paris collections with all these 5Ts being so excited trying to find the seat. They were like, so stand standing. at the back. Um, but I did, I, uh, in, in um, the, the, for New Year's Eve um, 1985, I went to New York for the first time. And New York then was a kind of very, it was kind of a frontier town. It was quite rough. You know, the city was, had been on the verge of bankruptcy. Incredible to imagine now. And um, the downtown art scene was very exciting. The downtown club scene was exciting. I was excited by the uptown ladies. So it was, it was this world of... Um, uh, of amazing contrast and excitement. And um, the Rhine, uh, uh, Ralph Lauren had just opened the Rhinelander mansion, and I went uptown to see it. And I must say, it had this incredible um, primal impact on me because, as you can see, you know, we're in this immersive Ralph Lauren world now. But at that point, no one had done that. You know, I knew Ralph's work from the pages of. Um, British Vogue, and so I was very much aware of this very seductive fashion world that Ralph had created. But going to the Rhinelander Mansion, which was an amazing place that had been built, um, I don't know if anyone's watched The Gilded Age, but it, in totally that story, it had been built by an Arivist hostess who wanted to outdo the Vanderbilts. And <laughs> it had had a very interesting um, history. It had been divided, subdivided into apartments, and quite interesting writers and tastemakers had lived there through the years. Anyway, Ralph um, created this whole immersive environment. And you walked in, it was the first time that I really realized that fashion and interiors were all part of the same vocabulary and language and that everything connected. And, um, you know, you walked in and there were um, ancestral portraits up the stairs and all these things you've never seen and an amazing kind of Turkish rug down there as a stair runner. And you just wanted everything, you know, and maybe I could only afford a tie or a polo shirt. <laughs> um, but you felt so excited that you'd come away with a bit of this magic. So. Absolutely. Yes. So um, since then, you've been traveling a lot. I mean, I, I, I've never seen, um, I think you're worse than me in traveling all over the world, like two days here and three days there. But you spent a lot of time in Tangier. Um, Tangier for you has always been a place of inspiration. Some of your best friends live there. And probably this is one of the best stories um, that I remember actually still of uh, Stefan Johnson's house in Tangier. Yes. Why Tangier and why all this fascination about this place? Um, you know, Tangier is a, is a port city um, on the north coast of Morocco. You can see southern Spain. It's just five miles across the Straits of Gibraltar. And um, so, Europe, you know, Europe is there, it's almost tangible, but you're also in Morocco, which is, has its own language and environment. And so you had all these, when I first went in the late 80s, there were all these amazing expats who um, had created these extraordinary environments that were half Albany, you know, like 
very, very chic London, but with Moroccan touches and a sense of Moroccan color because you realize that the, um, the light of Morocco is so special and very, very vibrant colors work amazingly there. You know, the kind of colors that you couldn't really use in Milan or London, say. So it was this idea of, you know, English antiques with Moroccan carpets with these amazing colors. And Stéphane Janson, um, a French, um, designer who's based here, his partner in Boto Pasti is a um, revered Italian writer. Um, they were renting houses and I stayed with them for the first few summers and then they bought a house, the Villa Tabarik Ala, um, which was very modest but again in, the, in, the, in its first iteration was all about um, colour and rock and artefacts and all this kind of thing. Subsequently they worked with their friends um, Laura and Roberto from Studio Perigali and it became a much more kind of splendid um, hispano moresque evocation. Um, so I've, it's been fun also seeing the lives of houses, and that's a house that I've been able to kind of track through the decades. Um, from so, from yeah. Tangier, we go to southern France. We so go to southern France, France um, in, again, is one of those most iconic stories that I still remember, the Janet de Botton's house. Um, with one of the most charming uh, dining rooms. I, I hope you can see it with the plates everywhere. They become like uh, the collection of plates as a decoration of the walls. Um, why this uh, uh, fascination with, the, the Janet, with Janet's house? Well, um, just a bit of bio, sort of autobiography. So um, in 1992, I'd been at um, Harper's and Queen. They finally offered me a job. Then I became the fashion and style director. And I had a wonderful time as a fashion editor traveling the world with... Um, working with people like Mapplethorpe and David Seidner and Francois Allard and Mario Testino and uh, traveling the world, um, you know, P Peru, Brazil, Egypt. Um, and I got, I decorated my own apartment in London, um, which was probably not much bigger than this platform up here, um, <laughs> but crowded with incident and objects and decoration, and American Vogue photographed it as a little kind of inspiration story at the back they of the book. They didn't have a, a Moroccan-style bathroom in the middle. They did have like, a Moroccan-style yes. bathroom in the middle, you're quite right, which was okay. just much smaller <laughs> than this platform that we're immediately sitting on. Um, and quite out of the blue, just as the story was about to be pr pr printed, or actually when the story had come into the Vogue magazine, I got a call, and the voice, a very clipped voice on the end of the line said, hi, this is Anna Winter. Um, our style editor's just left. I, I'm looking at your apartment. I can see that you're very into decoration. I'd like you to come to Vogue and write about decoration for us. I mean, it wasn't so much an invitation as a command. <laughs> so I thought, okay, well, I better, I better obey. And as I've said, I was so excited by the idea of New York. I adored my spending time there. I had a, by that point, I had a big network of friends. Um, Anna Winter was already a mythic figure. She'd, she'd been at American Vogue a couple of years and really kind of turned it around. And I thought, well, this is an opportunity I can't turn down. I'll just try it for a couple of years. That was 30 years ago. So um, I went to Vogue and I was kind of tasked um, with um, covering houses and decoration and gardens and architecture for the magazine but of course, folding in the world of fashion. So it was always trying to find a subject who was in Vogue's world or Vogue world adjacent, who happened to have an amazing environment. Janet de Bottom was a great friend. Um, this story, I was, this was one of those stories that took 15 years of wooing, you know, because she's very private. Um, but she'd kind of, um, um, she'd found this, she looked and looked and looked for a chateau in the south of France. And um, they're, they're all built uh, in, that, in that part of Provence, they're, they're all built very enclosed and they feel a little bit claustrophobic because you're protecting yourself from the wind. And she finally found a, a, a hay barn that was on um, basically a cliff edge that dropped and then it was the marshlands of the Camargue. And so um, she turned the, this cow barn into what really very convincingly looked like a 17th century um, um, sure. manorial house. It was a very Ralph Lauren immersive transformation of a, of a space that was nothing beforehand. And um, created gardens and where there had been marshland, suddenly there were very, there was this wonderful maze. 
um, and you know the, cow, the, the cows of the Camargue in the distance. So it was, it was, and it was a house I'd always loved and been lucky enough to stay in. And you know, I just, I, I worked and worked and worked, and finally, finally, we got to document it. Um, and you've been back many times. I, I go every summer and quite a lot of Christmases. Yes, yeah, so it's a, it's a wonderful place, and that's really la de vivre, you know, the art of living. Um, there is another um, beautiful story that uh, you did. It was at uh, Ashcombe, um, the house of Cecil Beaton that then was bought yeah, by so, Madonna. So, as you can imagine, I was obsessed by Ashcombe House, which was Cecil Beaton's first country house before Reddish. And, I, um, 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 and when I heard that Madonna had bought it um, in, her, in her life as Mrs. Guy Ritchie, I thought this is really... Um, Okay, this is the story I have to go for. And again, that was, that was years and years and years and years. And finally, she had an album yes. to promote. And, um, How did you manage to convince her? Well, we convinced her because she had an album to promote. And, she, um, <laughs> and a, a very young photographer called Tim Walker, who hadn't worked for the American Vogue at that point, um, worked with us on a portfolio of images, inspiration images. And it was all these pictures of Cecil Beaton Pictures just like this, Cecil Beaton, there he is with um, Adela Stair and Lady Parley and Tallulah Bankhead um, and um, Edward Tilly Losh um, in the 30s. And um, he put those and then he put little sketches of, of how Madonna could be, could be in these scenarios. And, she, and it was so beautiful, he'd really done an album and it was so beautiful that um, she thought, um, she, she said, yes, let's go for it. And it was incredibly exciting. And we don't have permission to use the images, I'm afraid. But you have to take my word for it. We had her in McQueen feeding, scattering feed to the chickens and um, very improbable Madonna situations. But it was, it was wonderful. And it was very exciting to be in the house, which is... So being there, um, you, being an Ashcombe with Madonna, but did you ever see pictures of Ashcombe as it was before? Well, yes, I, I was very familiar with all these kind of pictures. And did she, um, what was her decorating? I mean, what did she change she, or what um, did she not change? She has very good taste in interiors. Um, and it was, you know, it was um, um, the way you would imagine a cool, um, a, a mega star would do English country. There was... From the stairs on up, it was all rather downy, white carpet, very Jean Harlow. But the rest of it was, <laughs> you know, Keelan covered sofas and, you know, a family kitchen living, you know. So the, the wonderful thing for me was that you went upstairs in one of the guest bedrooms, I opened the cupboard, and there was the remains of a mural that a, a, a subsequent owner had painted over, not Madonna, I hasten to add, where Beaton had asked um, his friends, so Christian Berard, Pavel Chelichev, Oliver Messel, all these wonderful decorative and artists of the time to paint a different circus figure. So it would be oh. like a kind of, and, and there was, uh, I think, Rex Whistler's strong man was there and um, literally in the, at the back of a closet door. Um, and, and what I had never quite realized about the house is that it's built literally on the top and the side of a, of a deep valley, like a bowl. So you're immersed in this amazing landscape. So actually the poetry of being in the space was very different even from the wonderful yeah. So featuring so many um, houses, you know, for American Vogue, when you, when you, as you said, when you joined as a style editor, then to um, your own houses that uh, for, um, by coincidence, they've actually been featured by the World of Interiors already at the time. Tell us about this, uh, this first house you're, of yours in New York. Well, it, uh, I was so, so, you know, because of course for me to have a, a, a place published in the World of Interiors was the absolute holy grail of decorating um, of, of taste endorsement. And so I was, I was really thrilled. My first New York apartment um, um, to be photographed was on 12th Street in a Bing and Bing building, at this, you know, a sort of downtown doorman building. And um, as you'll see, I kind of, um, um, I, wanted to create, I wanted to create an environment that absorbed a little bit of Stephen, uh, Tennant. Stephen Tennant, a bit Stephen of Cecil Beaton, a bit of Bunny Roger, a little bit of Tangier. Um, all the things I love kind of put into this little space. Um, and Francois Allard came to photograph it, and this is how it looked. It's, you know, it's, <laughs> even in those early days, it's a little bit heading to the last days of Stephen Tennant, quite crowded. Um, but there wasn't we see, much a, lot space of, we see was a lot of patterns happening. Uh, yes, pattern and color. And there was a um, Stephen Sills, a great American decorator, who was a friend of mine, came in and he was like, 
I was like, what can I do with this? Because it was a generic sort of cookie cutter apartment. He was like, oh, honey, you need to put leopard carpet down through the whole thing. If you put the same carpet everywhere, it's going to make the apartment look twice as big. I thought, OK, he's really lost it. But I, but I was turned on by the idea of leopard carpet. I did put leopard carpet down. And in fact, the apartment did look twice as big. It was the craziest thing. So that was a, that was a good um, tip from a, from a real professional master of the game. Um, there we go. And then, okay. And then, exactly. Then, you know, from, from New York to your Paris apartment. This was a Paris apartment. So at a certain point, I was made European editor at large. And that involved having a, an apartment in Paris. I found this wonderful place. And you'll be surprised by this iteration to discover that I thought, okay, this is going to be my experiment in minimalism. It's this, <laughs> it's this wonderful um, parquet moulur cheminée, you know, like a second empire house manny an apartment with, you know, f wonderful fireplace. It, it was basically the, the back wing of a very big apartment. So it was the, di it was the gallery to get to the but dining the, room, the, gal yes, the dining the room, and then a couple of little service rooms behind it. So that became my apartment. And again, this made it to the world of interiors. This made it to the world of interiors. I thought, OK, yes, this is my minimal th iteration. So at the beginning, there was just a divan bed in the middle of the room. And I thought, God, this is such a chic way to live. And then I went to the, <laughs> and I went to the Paris flea market the first weekend and came back with half a dozen things. And then the <laughs> next weekend, and then I discovered Druo, which is this amazing um, um, conglomerate of auction houses in Paris. And you, it's one hit, it's one hit shopping. You go there. There are fifteen or so um, viewing rooms, all with different auction houses. So of course, there's going to be at least one thing in one of these rooms that you're going to want. And slowly, well, not so slowly, but very surely, um, the apartment kind of built up and suddenly, you know, this, it is. Well, it, this, is my, it, this is my version of minimalism, but, you know, it's not John Paulson, let's just say that. And well, how, did, how did you manage to empty it when you had to leave it? Do you know what? I had to bite the bullet. I, I, at this, th that point, when I gave up that apartment, I was also giving up London and consolidating in a bigger New York apartment than the one I'd had before. But still, it was the contents of three apartments. I was paying so much in storage, and I thought, this is really ridiculous. I'm just going to have to absolutely have an auction. And I did an auction with Bonhams, and I sold a lot of things, and everything was like, you know, a, a vital organ being torn from my body. And then... Oh, I remember <laughs> I stole one of your chandeliers, I think, from the Paris apartment. Uh, yeah. pro yes. Probably, yes. I mean, it was, yes. Uh, but, uh, but I have to say, the day after the auction, I felt a, a, a lightening of the mood. And what was very, very exciting was discovering where things had ended up. Um, because, you know, the auction house will never tell you, so you just have to rely on word of mouth or someone saying. And it was absolutely, I mean, literally, Mick Jagger was like, oh, yeah, I bought that thing. I was like, OK, that's exciting. Um, <laughs> and people whose taste I actually really admired had kind of bought things. And then, you know, some young kid, much as I had been 20 years before, was like, Oh, you know, I saved up and I managed to get one of your Moroccan rugs. And so it was very exciting being someone who's so obsessed with provenance and having things in my own home that have past histories. It was kind of flattering and thrilling to think someone would want something, of, be buying it as part of, you know, some, something of mine. And then the, 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 New York, the New York home, the New York, uh, yes. your latest house that again made it to the World of Tears. Yes, absolutely. Well, this I, this was, this I did with Studio Perigali, uh, Roberto and Laura, who are great friends of mine. They came to see the apartment when I first bought it. They're mostly de dealing with the titans of industry and society and everything, and I wouldn't have ever dared, dreamt to ask them to help me. <laughs> but I, wanted, I did want them to see the space, because I was quite excited by it. Had this double what was the concept? Well, and then uh, Roberto has basically set, literally sketched on the back literally sketched on the back of an envelope a scheme for, the, for how we would transfer the, the big living room into a library drawing room um, with all the book, every, everything. To, I mean, and, and he said, you know, this could be our, this would be our calling card in, in America. It would be our first New York project. And the only condition is basically <laughs> you have to do every single thing I tell you. Okay. So <laughs> I, I, I wasn't really, oops, oops. I wasn't really used to um, ceding my taste to anyone, um, but I, I was so neurotic that any little, any, any single thing I got, I would send a picture saying, what do you think of this? And um, 
And Roberta would say, my Amish, it's so sad. It's so sad. You know, so that would be <laughs> put on the back burner. There, there he is. Um, is that all true? What is that? Totally saying? true. Yes. And then... <laughs> Then the incredible thing was, then these things started coming in, like, you know, samples for handmade paper and thing, and everything was like my taste, but amplified, you know. And then I realized that actually working with a professional and an architect who understands spatial things, and in a New York apartment, you know, it's all about saving space, and it's like counterintuitive things, like, well, if you drop this ceiling, first of all, it's going to hide the the AC that you're putting in, but it's also going to make the experience of walking into this high ceiling room that much more exhilarating. So all those kind of things. And it's very funny working with Laura and Roberto because Roberto is a philosopher and uh, a dreamer, and Laura is a mother who thinks about practical things. So she'd be saying, well, you know, if we do this, this, and this, there's somewhere to put the vacuum cleaner. And was like, he doesn't need a vacuum cleaner. He doesn't need a kitchen. He doesn't need anywhere to hang coats. He can buy a beautiful wardrobe for that. Anyway, so it was this kind of dialogue between the two of them. And in the end, what, what transpired, I think, was this kind of incredible... If we go back a page, one of the things that was so amazing, keep going, was the, um, this... Um, um, the, the reading room. The, the, the uh, dining room... Um, uh, which doubles as a spare bedroom. They, we'd found this. Um, Louis says, um, car, beautifully carved panel. I loved it because it had a lilac and a rose sprigs, um, and they designed this room that had exactly the same thing on the opposite side. It was incredibly elaborate, really, really good. Louis says carving, and I was like, oh my god, I'm, there's no way I can afford to have someone carve this thing. And they said, no, no, don't worry, it's going to happen, it's going to happen. And they installed the room, and one, one side looked identical to the other. And I was like, OK, well, how did that happen? And they did a resin cast, and then a, an amazing trompe l'oeil painter who painted it exactly like the pale green, which we'd scraped, the, we'd scraped the subsequent paint and got to the thing. So, you know, all these magical touches that really... But I remember when I came to see it for the first time, I was impressed by the bedroom because I, I've never seen so many patterns and so many chins and so many flowers and so much camouflage put together in one room. I remember once I, I, I dropped a cufflinks, I never found it anymore. <laughs> so um, tell us about, I mean, that was more Roberto, more, more Robin Hamish. Um, well, um, this is both. I, I found a bolt of this um, lilac chintz, which obviously I was very drawn to, and it, it was proper chintz, it had the shine to it. And um, <laughs> Laura took one look at it and said, well, yes, yes, but the shine, it's, it's so American, it's so American. <laughs> um, we're going we're gonna, to we're gonna wash the shine out, and so took it back to a sort of softer thing. I was like, oh, I like the chins. But actually, it was, you know, um, yeah, this room, I thought, so tell us, I thought this was going to be the kind of... This, what's on the carpet? I mean, can you please tell us all about the carpet? Yeah, the carpet is, um, looks like moss. It's a, it's a Wilton carpet from Colfax and Fowler that I'd always loved, they had to thing. And we upholstered the walls in the fabric, did the curtains, the bed in a Madeleine Castang. I mean, we've seen, you know, the three, you know, the three, uh, three of your houses, actually, all of them featured in the world of interiors. You've been working at American Vogue for almost 25 years. 30 well, years. 30 years, sorry, I, I want to take some off. Um, and then last September, you were, um, you know, we were called by Anna to uh, edit the world of interiors. Yes. What was your reaction when, you know, the call arrived? Um, well, <laughs> it came with a caveat, which is that you'll be keeping the day job, <laughs> um, but I think you're, you know, you're the only person for it and everything, you know. Um, uh, Anna is extremely good at um, uh, phrasing and shaping things, and <laughs> she, ba she basically said, um, this was on a Friday, she called me in on a Friday, and she said, you've got the weekend to think about it, and um, come in at 8 o'clock and tell me yes on, <laughs> on Monday morning. So, um, I mean, it was, a, it was something I had to think about in terms of a lifestyle change because I'd been moving back to London and so on. Um, but in, conceptually, of course, it was just um, the dream project because I was feeling more and more drawn to England and Europe and feeling more nostalgic for the home country. And... Um, 
you know, the world of interiors is a magazine I've revered since the November 1981 issue that Min Hogg, uh, Min Hogg's debut issue. I remember there was a, um, a BBC nationwide documentary um, that showed this rather flamboyant theatrical woman putting together a magazine about interiors. I thought, well, that's a really bizarre idea. Why would you do that? And she was in a stately home, and I, I never forget, she picked up a, a, a cushion that was on a sofa, and she hurled it back at the cushion so that it would look lived in, you know, as though someone had just sat in it and stepped out of it, instead of like a perfectly plumped up cushion. And I thought, this is going to be interesting. And then I, 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 I had to wait till the first issue hit the um, St. Martin's Library, because um, uh, it, it was a bit hors de bouger. And then um, and I saw it and I thought, God, this is really incredible. This very exciting mix of, you know, you've got something that is like Memphis modern, and then you've got this, then you've got Buckingham Palace, literally, and then you've got uh, a cow barn. Um, and I thought, this is so exciting and inspirational. And, you know, I've had 40 years of inspiration for it. And I thought, this is, a, I've been entrusted with this absolute jewel. And, you know, how do I take the DNA and give it a little bit of my, stamp, really think about the world of interiors and think globally with a lot of global voices and, um, you know, gently pivot to the 2020s and um, develop um, digital um, interactive strategies that will kind of enhance the reader experience with video and audio and additional content and so on, all those exciting things you can do. Um, and bring in maybe some digital first audience and a global audience, people who can't have access to the physical copy. But at the same time, you know, as um, David said, make sure that the, ensure that the um, print issue is this magical, desirable thing that you want to collect and keep, as I have done, you know, <laughs> adding, to the, adding to the dust traps in my apartment, 40 years of World of Interiors. Um, <coughs> And so, you know, that's been, um, uh, that's been the um, uh, question that we've posed. And, you know, at the beginning, it was, it was sort of you and me and Emily Tobin, and um, uh, who's our wonderful deputy editor, kind of. On um, a rainy day on the 4th of January. <laughs> on a rainy day <laughs> on, the, on the 7th of January or whatever. Thing. OK, so we've well, got we, three we weeks to do an issue. What are we going to do? Well, well we, we, chose, we chose a desk first. That was the first we thing. So we chose we, 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 right, okay, your can. desk. Exactly. Um, and, um, and luck, you know, I, for a couple of months, I'd been strategizing and we'd been starting to, to photograph things. And I called on an on a amazing network of taste-making friends who, um, who I could rely on um, to, uh, I, I said, you know, if you see places that inspire you, please let us know about them. And, you know, maybe we can showcase them in the magazine. And so, you know, there were friends in um, Mexico City and Sub-Saharan Africa and India and the Far East and all through Europe and England, of course, uh, and Britain, of course. And, um, you know, bringing in stories. So suddenly we were able to start shaping the magazine with these really exciting things that came in. I think we got here some image, images of actually the first, the cover story of your first issue that was um, the April 2022. Yes. Um, there was a pink house and the cover was a pink cover. <laughs> and I don't think I've ever seen a magazine cover so much <laughs> on social media, Instagram, regrammed and regrammed again and Instagram. What was your, what was, what was the, the choice of the cover uh, process? Well, um, they're very good friends, and um, I'd um, uh, both of ours, in fact. And there was a lot of buzz about their apartment, and everyone wanted to showcase it. I mean, a lot of other shelter titles. And um, I, I went to them, and of course, the World of Interiors is their favorite magazine. And so, with a with a bit of wooing, and I just thought, you know, this is going to give us. We've come out of a moment. This was for our April issue. I thought we've come out of two years of uh, gloomy, of gloom period. and um, dystopia, and being kind of turned in on ourselves. And I just wanted something that was euphoric and upbeat and joyful. And you know, um, I went to do the story my, myself, so I, I styled it with Mathieu Salvan, who was a photographer who was kind of new to the magazine, and. Um, it was so fun, and actually, I was photographing a still life of the hall table that you see in that first spread um, there. Um, 
and there was a little dish that had <laughs> these face, their face masks on it, um, their COVID face masks, and they chose them face masks. They've managed to find, being these Eastleets, they've managed to find these face masks that were ombre shaded in different shades of pink going pink. to shocking pink. So they matched the, the wall. I thought, okay, that's such a telling detail for April 2022. And I know that the world of interiors has been this timeless thing. It's kind of prided itself on having stories that don't fit any particular moment or time. But I thought we're coming out of this, hopefully emerging from this moment that is so, so specific and we should acknowledge it. So actually when I was shooting it, I was thinking of it being potentially a cover and the surprise of having a detail and a close up and so on. And you know, we tried a couple of other things, but that was really what I was thinking about. And we put it up on the wall, and, you know, I'm, although I'm very embracing, obviously, of the digital world, I also work in quite an analog way. I do like a printout. I like to be able yeah. to see things on the floor and pin boards and all that. I mean, virtual, uh, real pin boards as well as virtual ones. Um, and we, we put it on a, on a dummy cover with a thing and put it at the far end of the room. And I thought, well, I could see that really jumping out on the newsstand. Absolutely. And let's face it, on Instagram and in social media, and um, um, I was a little bit worried. I went through to our commercial team and said, what do you think about this? Because it is a detail, you know, it's a thing. And, um, um, and our, our wonderful publisher was very embracing of it. So um, that was um, so that was a go. And, I, and it, you know, it got very, I think it got very positive feedback. Yeah. And it, it sort of fit the moment of, you know, of wanting something exhilarating and joyful and, optimistic, you know, thinking about the future and um, not dwelling on what we'd all been through. Although it was pink and not mauve, anyway. It was pink it. and not... I, I did toy with the idea of a live cover. I thought, that's, exactly. that's a bit too eager. We were or, sure at the office it's going to be the first cover. It's going to be a mauve <laughs> wallpaper, a mauve sofa, whatever. Yeah, it I, put, I put myself on a back burner. I thought, you know, no, let's, I'll, I'll move to an adjacent colour. And then last and final images are actually from the latest issue that is the July issue that we call the World of Exteriors. Yes. Um, that is uh, the Villa Oasis in Marrakesh that I'm sure it had also an incredible uh, impact on your... Um, well, it did, yeah. I mean, um, so the, traditionally the July issue has had this kind of little insert that's all about the World of Exteriors. I thought I'm going to take those pages, put them in the centre of the book, the, 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 the body of the magazine, and have the whole thing dedicated to this idea of environment and um, gardens and um, structures that exist in gardens, a gardener's cottage. Um, and um, it was a little bit difficult because we were producing this, at the, you know, in, in bleak February um, in London, and um, there was no inventory of gardens, so <laughs> I really had to, we, we had to think outside the box. So we did a Burley Marx garden in Brazil, and um, luckily, Francois Allard, a great photographer who I'd been working with since the late, late 80s at Harper's and then all through my American Vogue career, um, had a photograph of um, the Villa Oasis, which is the, 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 the last house in Marrakesh of Yves Saint Laurent and his partner Pierre Berger, that um, Madison Cox, the great landscape uh, garden designer, as he likes to be called, not landscape architect, um, had staged his own interventions. He turned the lawn into kind of chips of, um, of um, pink um, stone from the Sahara, um, from the Atlas Mountains. Um, and I like the idea of contrasting the interiors with the exteriors and folding the whole aesthetic. Um, and, you know, it's a house that Eastheats will know, but they won't know it through Francois Allard's eyes and in this current iteration of the, of the very special gardens as they really were um, uh, when Saint Laurent was there. And of course, it's next door to the Majorel Gardens that 400,000 visitors a year visit, or whatever it is, 4,000 visitors a day, um, and that I'd known since the late 80s. And I was always so excited to think that I was in the Majorel Gardens and maybe Yves Saint Laurent was sitting at, if we go back, um, in that room on the left at that table, sketching his new collection. And the idea of being proximus to greatness but never being able to get in. And suddenly this idea that you could open the doors to our readership and our public was just uh, an opportunity that I didn't think we could miss and it, it ended up being our cover story. So. Fantastic. Hey, Misha, thank you so much. Thank you everyone for being here this morning. Thank you. Thank you.